introduce my former boss, uh, <laughs> Dr. Julia Cornegy. As maybe you've uh, heard Julia say, she is a graduate of uh, NC State Horticulture. She graduated in uh, 1976. She was a floriculture major. Uh, later on, we, we had her come back and be department head for seven and a half years. Uh, she started in 2003 and, and has just now uh, uh, stepped out. And um, in, her, uh, in, in so doing, she taught a, a public gardens course uh, last fall. And uh, I had a graduate student in that and just thought it was a, a great course. And so we know that it was. Uh, Julia will also be teaching a uh, home food production course uh, upcoming too. She's filling in some, some, some areas that, that we really need in the department. Um, before coming to the um, uh, Department of Horticulture as department head, Julia was, at, was the director of uh, Fair Fairchild uh, Gardens. Um, she was there from 97 to 2003, so she has she has a little bit of history in, in Arboretum and uh, uh, working with uh, gardens and Arboretum. Um, we're going to hear about some of her previous life before uh, gardens and Arboretum, uh, <clears throat> in that uh, um, we'll be hearing about her time in, in Columbia, uh, where she uh, was uh, worked from 1979 to 1997 with three years out to get a Ph.D. at Cornell. So, Julia, we're really looking forward to your presentation. lectures here at the Arboretum. They're, they're always very informative and really interesting. It sounds like there's some really good ones coming up. It's definitely, you can see it's spring with all the different programs that there are happening here at the Arboretum over the next month. Well, it's my pleasure to talk about heliconias. Um, just to show of hands, how many people know what heliconias are? All right. I didn't see any of the students raise their hand. How many people know what a heliconia is? Okay. Uh, how many people have been into the tropics, been on a cruise, or in a hotel, or South Florida even? Well, you've probably seen heliconias because they're, they're everywhere now throughout the tropics. It's a, it's a formal part of landscapes, botanical gardens, public parks, floral arrangements. They're very, very common in the tropics. Not that common in the United States outside of Florida, California, New York, the, the larger metropolitan areas. Not at all common in North Carolina. Uh, I don't know if I've seen a heliconia uh, in a bank or in a hotel lobby. Too bad, because they're a really wonderful group of plants. So most of my talk is on heliconias, but I'm going to just cover a few other tropicals, too, that we have on our farm. Um, <coughs> Just to place where these are, actually, I'll move that over there. There's a family, there's an order called the uh, Zingiberales. That's this whole group of fascinating plants that are in, uh, in the tropics. This is the, the uh, family of Heliconias. This is the family of the bananas, the musas. This is the Stritzletsias, the like the bird of paradise. Um, these are the costas, these are cannas, and marinaceas. All of this is the, the ginger borelis family uh, order of plants, and these are the families. Now, the heliconias used to be in the banana family. They were, they were part of the musa families. But in 1998, they were split off 
and made into their own family with just one genus, Heliconia. And Heliconia, it comes from a Greek word meaning from Mount Helicon. And Mount Helicon in the, the days of the gods and the goddesses were where the mooses uh, resided. And the mooses were the goddess of the arts and the sciences. And they were supposed to be eternally young and beautiful. And that's kind of what Heliconias are. They're eternally young, very long base life, and beautiful. Um, there's about 200 and some species and about that many cultivars, so there's a lot of variation in Heliconias. Some of it, and of this, probably around 50 are commercially grown. The others are more oddities and uh, botanical specimens. Now they are rhizop rhizotomous plants. They're, they're an herb. You grow them uh, in clones with the rhizomes. With these are the eyes or the buds. And they produce these inflorescence with these bracts. Now, bracts are, students, modified leaves. Very good. <laughs> in the modified leaves, in these bracts, are the flowers. This is where the inflorescence, the flowers are. And heliconias are hermaphroditic, which means? <laughs> Very good. Yeah, that's pretty fast, yes. Both sexes. Uh, they form these uh, droops, and, and they have one to three seeds in each of the droops. Now, uh, these bracts can be very, very large. Uh, usually they're pendant, but there are a number that are uh, erect, a lot of, and there's a number that are pendant as well. Uh, actually, some that twist and spiral. The major center of distribution is in the American tropics, including the Caribbean. This is where you find most of the species. But there's this very odd disjunct group of only six species that's found in the old world in the Pacific Islands from Samoa all the way west to Indonesia. Just six species. They're a little bit different. Uh, they tend to be more of a green color in fluorescence rather than the brightly colors. And they tend to have orange or red droops rather than the blue ones that you find in the Caribbean. But of course now these are all grown everywhere all over the place. Uh, and, um, uh, but it's very interesting that this small group has, was found in the old world. You find them between 500 and 2,000 meters above sea level. Uh, but most of the species are not at the, these extreme levels, but are in the middle elevations, let's say from 800 to about 1,500 meters, um, in the rain or cloud forest habitats. They need a lot of water. They do colonize open sites along wood sides, uh, river banks, uh, in the forest uh, light gap regions. Uh, Heliconials are moving that, and they also have been known to be moderately invasive because of their ability to, to move out in, in, into open areas. Uh, there are a few species that can survive in subtropical zones, like Miami. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, Fairchild Tropical Bot Botanical Garden was the home of the International Heliconia Society for many years. It has a collection of Heliconias there of about, oh, 30 species or so that will survive. Uh, they may get killed back to the ground, but they will come out and, and survive in that zone of Miami. Now, just a little sidebar here. Uh, Heliconias have been very influential in my life in the sense that the only reason I ended up being the director of Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden was because of Heliconias. My husband and I used to go to Miami to Fairchild because of the International Heliconia Society. Um, and there, you know, we got to know some of the people there, the curator, uh, David Barsaby, who unfortunately has died, and some of the other people who were very much into Heliconias at that time. And so when the position opened up at Fairchild to be director of research, I applied for it. I would have never apply for that because I'm a plant breeder. I work with field crops. Uh, but I applied for it, got the position, and then within a year and a half the director left and I applied for the position of director, became director of Fairchild. So you never know 
whatever kind of a hobby or an interest will take you, take that to heart, students. And don't leave yourself into a box of I can only be this, because you can be many things depending on your interests. So that, let's move on from that. Um, pollination biology. In the American tropics in the Caribbean, the heliconias are pollinated principally by hummingbirds. Hummingbirds have the perfect beak for getting into the flowers and uh, for taking the nectar and bringing it out and, and pollinating the flowers. Although they're hermaphroditic, they do need a pollinator to set seed. And it's usually the hummingbirds, you do find some beetles and other insects that will go into them and pollinate them but the hummingbirds are the most efficient form. Now it's interesting though that you hummingbirds flitting all over the place, you would think that you would have a lot of different inter, uh, interspecies, uh, hybrid crosses, but there's really not that many in Heliconias. There are a few, but it's not as prevalent as you would think. And even on our farm where we have lots and lots of different species, uh, I have very rarely, as a matter of fact, never found an interspecific uh, cross uh, coming up from a, a viable seed. Uh, but there are some, but it's very few. In the old world, on the, the Pacific Islands, it's bats and the uh, melophagids or the honey eater birds, I don't have a picture of that unfortunately, uh, that are the principal pollinators of Heliconia. So it's a different set of pollinators there. The indigenous people have used heliconias for eons. Uh, it's very good as a temporary thatch for shelters. If you're out in a hunting party and you, you, know, you need to set up a shelter, heliconia leaves work perfectly. They're pliable. You can weave them and you can have a temporary shelter. Of course, they use them as ornamentals in, their, in the villages. And they're also used for, in cooking as for wrappers and covers. And as a matter of fact, we use the heliconia leaves ourselves on our farm when we're cooking. Certain things just taste better when they're cooked in heliconia leaves. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, you have these people, and I'm only just going to give a couple of examples, and of course every uh, major group of plants has their fanatics. And in the heliconia world, there are the fanatics as well. And the one I'm going to talk about the most is John Cress. Has he ever been here as a speaker? No. He has a well, you need to get him to come. He's a fascinating person. He's the, um, the botanist and the curator at the um, Museum of Natural History of the Smithsonian. Uh, he has a PhD from Duke University, so this is his you know, uh, stomping grounds in his past. But he's one of these species collectors, you know. If we have some in here in our, in our uh, uh, arboretum here, our Quarterlington is one of them. People that go out and look for new species, they botanize all over the world. Uh, and he has botanized and collected species of heliconias all throughout Latin America, the Amazon, Madagascar, all through Indonesia, the South Pacific, uh, the South Asia, uh, into uh, Myanmar, collecting and characterizing heliconias. You know, so he has been to some very rough areas of the world very back areas, hard to get to, to collect heliconia species and to characterize them. Um, this is, this is uh, uh, Press right here, John Press. Uh, here he is when he was younger, and you know, there's an inflorescence right there, out in the back 40s of some, some Pacific island. Uh, this is the Bible for those who want to know about heliconias and uh, their identification. He published this with Fred Berry, and I'm going to talk about Fred in a little bit. He's also written some other books, The Art of Ex Plant Exploration, Botanica Magnifica, and this is his most recent book, The Weeping Goldsmith. And this is the 10 years of collecting in, in Miramar and some very incredible heliconias and other tropicals that he's found there. So he would be a good person to come and to lecture if we could get him here. He's a really great guy and a lot of fun, too. He's had some wonderful adventures all over the world. The other one is uh, Fred Berry. Now, Fred is not your <coughs> typical botanist. As a matter of fact, he's not a botanist. He's an ichthyologist. Okay, students, what's an ichthyologist? Fish. That's right. He studied fish. 
and he worked uh, for many, many years on the taxonomy of fish, tropical fishes especially. <laughs> he did quite a bit of work on fisheries management and sea turtle conservation. He's published well over 100 publications in this. Uh, he's well known in the whole fish world. But the last decade of his life, after he had retired, he dedicated to botany and went around the world botanizing and became enamored of Peliconias and um, has now 45 publications or had, uh, on uh, his botanical studies and even two Peliconias are named after him. So what an amazing man, you know, that world renowned in fish and now turned his attention to uh, and turned his attention to uh, Peliconias and Tropicals. And I had the pleasure of meeting him at Fairchild. And I can tell you, he is the Hemingway type of guy. You know, he's big and uh, dynamic. He's hard drinking and hard charging and all over the world. He was a fabulous, fabulous speaker. Um, he lived life largely without a doubt. And unfortunately, he died of cancer. But he would say he had really a, a, a wonderful life and uh, made a great contribution to, to, to science and to Heliconius. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how I came to be a Heliconia farmer and, uh, and then what we did on our farm. Well, I, uh, uh, as Ted mentioned, I went to work after I finished my master's degree here in, uh, in, at NC State to work at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture as a plant breeder, <coughs> working with dry beans, Phaseolus vulgaris. SEAP uh, is one of 16 international centers around the world that are dedicated to food production uh, in third world countries. Uh, one of the major ones is ERI, the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. The uh, CIMIT, which is the Maize and Wheat Institute in Mexico. SIP is the Center for Potatoes in Peru. Uh, SIAP worked on dry beans, uh, cassava, the tropical forages, and rice for Latin America. There are three or four centers in Africa. There's a center in India, in India, one in Syria. They were set up in the 60s by the Rockefeller Foundations and USAID and other governments to stop uh, world food hunger. Because at that time, there was famine in India, there was famine in China, and there was a real danger of that we were going to be hungry, especially the third world. We were almost there again, uh, sadly enough. Uh, we're going to find ourselves in this situation within your lifetime uh, when we get again to, we grow to 9 billion people. How are we going to feed everyone, especially with the challenges that we face in the future with energy, water, and so forth. So I went there to work in Beans and uh, met and married a Colombian man, Alfredo Escobar, who was a school teacher uh, but with a lot of passion for plants. We had two children, Louisa and Lucas. Uh, we wanted to make sure our children had opportunity to be outside of the city of Cali and, and have a, the beautiful world of Colombia. So we bought a coffee farm. Juan Valdez, beautiful coffee, you know, idyllic life. Well, coffee prices tanked and our beautiful adventure in being coffee growers ended. We couldn't make any money. This is there was a world glut of coffee. Brazil had come in in a big way. And so we looked around for something else to do. And I said, aha, let's do flowers. I have a degree in floriculture from NC State University. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we decided we would grow heliconias. And we worked with the Cooperative Extension Service of Columbia and um, started our heliconia farm. Now this is a map of Colombia. Colombia is uh, uniquely situated in that it's at the end of Panama, but it has the warm Caribbean Sea to the north and the cold Pacific Ocean to the west. It has three major mountain Andean rains that run through the western part of the country. This part is a big cerrados or uh, flat 
pasture, uh, uh, not really pasture, but there's a lot of uh, cattle run out in this area. Uh, it's called the Cerrados. And down here is the uh, Amazon jungle. Uh, it's an incredibly rich land. And in between, in the, all these Andes, there's these uh, valleys and rich volcanic soils. Colombia is, is, is got a lot of riches in many, many ways. It also has oil, carbon, emeralds, and a lot of other things we won't talk about. Um, but it's an incredibly beautiful country. Um, I lived here in Cali. And this Cali is in the Departamento, which is the state of Valle de Cauca, right here. That's, that's the state where the Cali is. And then within this state, Here's the, the, the municipality of Cali, and our farm is right in this municipality of Restrepo, right here. Now, it's actually, this is not a very far distance. This is only about 45 miles from here to there, but you have to go over a mountain range and down. So that makes it a lot harder to get there. Uh, Restrepo is at 1,400 meters, which is actually the perfect, perfect temperature of living in the tropics. Warm in the day, cool at night, you have to have a blanket. Uh, receives, uh, has two rain, uh, rainy seasons and gets about 75 inches of rain a year, which is a good amount of rain. Uh, the soils are generally fertile, volcanic, the pH of 5, 6. They are low in phosphorus. This is Kali. Um, we live over on this side. It has about 3 million people. And it's on the edge of this big valley, very fertile valley, where they grow a lot of sugar cane. Sea out is out here. So to get to our farm, you take these roads and go up, climb up from the valley up to the top to a little over 1,800 meters. And then you go down the hill into this area of restraint Okay? And our farm is actually just right about here uh, on the hillside. And this is a long valley here. Uh, where, our, where, we, uh, where we have our farm. <coughs> and the major industries in this area are um, cattle and dairy. You can see the open uh, pasture land. Pineapples, coffee still, forestry, uh, fruits and vegetables for the Cali market. Not too many flower growers, but there are a few. Our farm is uh, Bay of Florida. Uh, we've owned it since 1993. We have 12 acres under flower production and three acres in pastures and building. This is my husband here, Alfredo. This is actually on our farm here in Johnston County. Uh, That's where my mom and dad were from, and I inherited my mom's farm. This is my husband trying to make compost out of this. <laughs> we actually did <laughs> this big southern red oak that we had to have chopped down because the lightning struck it. Um, I was just in Columbia with my daughter and my granddaughter. We just came back about uh, three weeks ago. We spent two weeks there. She graduated from university and wanted to go to Columbia and take her, take her daughter and spend two weeks there visiting uh, all our family there and seeing the things that she hadn't seen for a while. My husband's still in Columbia, so he'll be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, our farm is not a fancy farm. It's not a big hacienda. It's a, you know, it's a, an adobe type of house with bamboo and, um, you know, kind of a clay, uh, clay dirt wattle type of structure. All the, the rooms come out in this corridor. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty rustic. This is our kitchen. I made many a meal on that little three burner <laughs> stove. Um, these are, we have four bedrooms. They're all kind of monastic cell-like. <laughs> this is our dining room. Uh, there's a picture of Juan Valdez. <laughs> all the windows just open right up. You know, there's no screens. There's no, you know, it's just open. Uh, very simple living there. That's what we like. So let's talk about Heliconia production. They're all grown in the field. These are field crops. They're not greenhouse or pots or anything. These are field crops. And as you can see, they're big crops. So if you want to plant heliconias, one of the biggest challenges is getting all the rhizomes that you need to plant a field, you know, and uh, getting good planting material. Sometimes you can't find many, so you have to start with a small amount and multiply them. Uh, 
The spacing can be challenging because some of them need an enormous amount of spacing because they get to be, you know, clumps, you know, 15, 20 feet across. Others are smaller. You have to know how to judge the, the size of the, of the spacing. They're very heavy feeders like bananas. They need a lot of nitrogen, potassium especially. Um, they're heavy water users. Uh, they, they, some of them want to be in, in fairly dense shade and others in full sun, but the majority are in so, uh, semi-shade and so you have to have trees and you have to be able to have trees, big trees growing. The, the trees that they use in coffee plantations basically are the same ones that you use to shade heliconia. Um, we, don't, we didn't have very many problems with diseases. Root rots can be really bad, but we always disinfected our rhizomes well. Uh, and then another big challenge is the renovation. So when the center of the clumps die out, then you've got to kind of dig them up and start them again, and that can be challenging. Anyone who's ever dug up like our ornamental grasses here, you know how hard that is. Well, that can be a challenge to get them out. One of the things about heliconias, though, is that over time you really enrich the soil because all down here are all the cuttings from the biomass, you know, so you just chop it up and leave it down there and, um, and that enriches the soil. So once the, the crop is established, you really don't need to water it very much more and very lightly fertilize. Only once a year we would come in and throw down chicken manure and that would be it. The rest of the, their fertility needs would come from the composting that we did with the heliconias themselves. So this is what it looks like. You, you cut them up and you put them in these paint buckets and you haul them up to the packing sheds. You wash them in these barrels because you've got to get all the little insects and frogs and everything out of those racks. Because if you ship them into Miami and the customs finds a little frog in there, they'll burn the whole lot of it. So washing it is a very important part. That's my father-in-law right there, washing them. Uh, so there's a lot of labor involved in this. So let me just show you then um, some of the species that we have, that we grow commercially. This is a very popular one. This is the Wagneriana. Um, you see this a lot in arrangements. Uh, this flower is now past, it's too big, too many bracts. So that one would be chopped up and left on the ground. This is a good size. Actually, even maybe one bract less would be a very good size for shipping. This is a, uh, another very popular one, Rostrata. You can see here they just, you know, prolific producers, uh, incredible inflorescence. This is a bit too long for commercial purposes. We would usually harvest them when the bracts were about down to here, you know, about this many, not let it grow so much. Um, but just absolutely stunning plants. This is another uh, group of uh, species that are very popular in arrangement of beehives. They range from this kind of purple red to red red with a kind of a light green rim to red with purple and light green and lots of other colors in between and orangey and so forth, um, the highs. The orthotrichas look fairly similar to the highs, but they're different because they're fuzzy. Mm -hmm. You can't really tell that in these pictures, but they're, they're fuzzy. Um, and this is characteristic of this species. Again, you can see different variations in color and uh, shadings. It's another group, beautiful species of heliconia. And this group, Cetacorum, are our minis. These are our smallest heliconias. Uh, they grow about a oh, meter and a half high, uh, very dense clumps, very prolific flowers, and lots of different tones of uh, flower colors uh, in this group of Cetacorums. Uh, this is very popular in floral arrangements as, as fillers. <coughs> The Caribea are the biggest group of flowers. They are the big guys. Um, they grow 20 feet tall. You'll have stems like this. Um, massive flowers. You can see some of them here. Uh, come in a variety of assortment of colors and some of them are spotted. Um, very, very impressive flowers. Uh, very big and heavy flowers. 
this is one of our uh, natural uh, interspecific crosses. This is uh, the uh, flame uh, heliconia. Uh, usually you would sell it at two bracts or three bracts at the most. Uh, this is another fairly delicate heliconia, hirsuta, the lingulata. Lingulata is all in one plane. It's kind of interesting the way all, the, the bracts are kind of lined up like that. These are not that common in full ranges. We don't get many requests for those, but we we'll like them and just use them ourselves. Then the uh, Chartaceae's are the kind of the real incredible heliconias. This one is called Sexy Red, and this is Sexy Pink, and these are incredibly long inflorescence, very large, absolutely beautiful. Um, they make a stunning flowering arrangement, but not many people can use them. They really don't know how to use something quite like that. But you see a sexy pink, and this is like, wow, it just takes your breath away. Something like that could exist in nature. Now, we also do other uh, uh, species besides uh, the genera than just heliconias. We do uh, in the family Strutletsias, the Musas, and the Zingers, and the Gingers, and the Marathasias. Of course, this is the bird of paradise, which most people are familiar with. Um, and um, these are two. Um, uh, cultivars that we grow that are in the banana family. This is the torch, and this is the pink one, ornata. Uh, the torch is very, very popular, and this flower will last, it'll last easily six weeks in a maze. Uh, you can just, it's amazing the longevity of that one, much longer than this one. This one is very popular, and we ship out a lot of those. Other very popular ones are these gingers, the alpinas, they come in this purple, red, and pink. The, the red is probably the most popular, though we do ship a lot of the pinks. And then this is another ginger here. This one's not as popular, uh, but it's a very pretty, soft pastel. Not as well known in the floriculture trade. The other ones in the gingers are these um, emperors of the baston, the emperador, and the emperors. Bastion. <laughs> I don't know what the word is. It's in English, actually. Uh, they come in red and pink, and um, these are also quite popular. These just keep opening up, and uh, if, you cut, if you cut them when they're at this stage, they'll just keep opening up and opening up like this uh, over time, and again, very long lived and, and, and very long shed, uh, baseline. And then the maracas. Oh, these come in yellow and orange and kind of this mixed color. And those are also very spectacular uh, plants and arrangements. Uh, in the Maranthaceae, we have the, the Calatheas, the prayer plant, um, tropicals. Um, this one uh, also comes in a yellow form. And this one is called the cigar plant because they kind of look like cigars. Mm -hmm. and, this Calathea is also, the leaves of this is also used a lot in, in cooking as well. Now, so we cut them and ship them out every week. Uh, and uh, of course, right around Valentine's Day is when you're cutting and shipping a lot. And then the next big time is Mother's Day. Those are the big times of the year when you're shipping all the time. Uh, the um, Value, the wholesale values of heliconias is high, from about 50 cents a stem for the, um, the, the minis, the cetacorums, up to $15 or more a stem for the larger types, uh, the rostratas, the carabeas, and so forth. So it, it, they're not cheap flowers. You know, it's not like your mums or even your roses. Uh, this is a pretty expensive flower arrangement. But boy, is it spectacular. Now, you also, you know, you have to have a pretty significant uh, heavy vase or something to hold them up because they'll fall over if they're so heavy. And these are some other arrangements. This is with Wagneriana, with gingers and rostratas. This is with astricta and different orchids, just one flower, very striking. 
here's a full arrangement that you would see like in a hotel lobby with gingers, maranthas, uh, caribeas, and a, a type of strictness here with other tropicals. Very, very striking. So, the heliconias are really a group of plants where very little has been done actually to improve them. I talked about there's natural hybrids and there's the species, and the cultivars are just selections that have been done within the species. Uh, there's really not any breeding program, as a matter of fact, nothing that I know of that's been very successful at intercrossing them uh, and making new hybrids. But we really do need to work out uh, the breeding methods so that we can develop varieties that are smaller sized um, and, and, and less weight, because these are very heavy flowers. This would help decrease freight costs for those of us who are shipping these by air and give more versatility in flower arrangements. It would also be able to make them have a, a greater use in home landscapes in the tropics because these things can get very large and when you may not have the space to grow something but would like that level of a showy flower. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. The International Heliconia Society uh, gives uh, out grants for work on heliconias, uh, small grants that they try to support research in this area. There's not a lot of research going on, as you can imagine, and so whatever they can help support, they do. Uh, here's just a couple of references. Again, the one for um, Barry and Cress's book. Jules Janik has just come out with a review on heliconias, botany and horticulture of a new floral cultural crop. Not new, but anyway. Uh, not well used, actually. That's just come out in horticulture reviews. And of course, there's many other papers and a lot of papers that are in Spanish by uh, uh, botanists from Colombia, Peru, or Ecuador, or Brazil, and also from Costa Rica and other countries. So with that, I'll uh, end and take any questions that you may have. that you can take the, the rhizome out and put it under your crawl space and bring it out and they'll survive that way. But uh, no heliconias, unfortunately, that uh, I know of. Yes, Mark. I, I'm just curious about the, um, the the plant that you have here. Is that a evolutionary adaptation of the cracks? You know, the upper facing, I can see you know, there's some evolutionary, but then other pieces where it's downward facing and that bract seems to, you know, one way it looks like it catch water and uh -huh. other it seems like it's protecting the flowers. Is there I don't know, I can't tell that? you, but it's a good it's a good point, you know. I, I do think the uh, hummingbirds don't have a problem, you know, up right. or down getting to the flowers, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not sure why some of them became pendulous like that. But it's an uh, interesting point. I Evolutionary also have for your indigenous uses. When I was in Ecuador we, in the village I was in we ate actually eight Petioles of young leaves, like where they were still curled uh -huh. up, we would eat those. Okay. Ste steam them up? Or? Like a, yeah. yeah. Like, like a spinach type of thing? Mm -hmm. Kale? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Is there flower all year or is there some seasonal? There's a little seasonality to some of, to some of them, and uh, of course, they, they, when the rains come and you give them a shot of chicken manure, they take off and they produce, and, and during the dry seasons, they slow down some as well. Um, some species have a, will go through a period where they seem to go quiet for a while, and then they'll come back. But generally, we have production all year round. As a matter of fact, we have more flowers than we could possibly send out, and they just become compost. Yes. Where do you get uh, planting <coughs> stock of new varieties? Well, uh, we get it from other heliconia growers mainly. Now you can buy them commercially uh, out of uh, Costa Rica and Hawaii. There are uh, wholesalers that will sell uh, the rhizomes and you can order those. Um, in Colombia, we mainly just got them from other growers and collectors. Uh, 
actually Alfredo has actually collected a few things himself. I didn't show some of those. They're not that attractive, but they're interesting. Um, but uh, you go into the jungle and heliconias are everywhere, really. But yes, if you want to do a commercial, you would probably go and buy it from another, another grower. Are there any that have variegated foliage? Yeah, um, heliconias? Mm, not that I know of. The alpinas, uh, yeah, the gingers do, yeah. but not the heliconias. No. Now, there's some that have like bronzy leaves, some bronze on them, but not, not, not variegation. Very I know they're very heavy. What is the, the average weight of some of those very large ones? Well, depending how long the stem is, but you know, they can be three, four pounds a piece easily. Um, <coughs> and sometimes, you know, you will get orders for long stems, and they really want something very, very long. And, not too often, but uh, people would be willing to pay the extra freight on that. <coughs> yes? Do you include any natural foliage in the shipment? You know, the natural leaves with the flowers? <laughs> but not at heliconias. We do actually grow leaves of foliage for cuts of different uh, calatheas and ferns and so forth, but not for the heliconias. How do you split your time with working up here and being down there? How do you juggle that? Well, actually, it's, it's pretty much my husband and his family that do that. My <coughs> husband goes down every year for two months. He goes down in January and does all the, fourth, you know, the uh, Valentine's Day and then gets things ready for Mother's Day. And then my father-in-law would go every week and do the shipment. But on the farm, we have our farm foreman who lives there. He has a house. We have a cell phone. We call him all the time. Uh, it's, the communications is actually much, much better now. And even than before when we lived right there and had to drive up and down because there wasn't any way to really communicate well. So, uh, but I have to tell you that we're actually trying to sell the farm now. Mm. My father-in-law <coughs> is too old and um, he had a stroke last year and so he can actually no longer drive up to the farm. So we sell the, far the flowers to another, another uh, exporter but uh, it gets to be a problem after a while if you're not actually having somebody there, and so we're, going, we're trying to sell the farm. You said there hasn't been much breeding done on dwarf varieties, but are there some naturally smaller ones, small enough to grow in the greenhouse here? Uh, well, you could grow some of the cetacorns and the, um, the, the golden torch, but uh, wouldn't be enough production here to, other than just curiosity. You know, in a conservatory type of thing, you could grow them. But you would have a problem probably with some day length effects on them and seasonality of flowering production. Yeah, uh, you could try one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.